Uh, did you see on the news that it's, it's now that time of the year again? It's corn maze season. It's that time they open up the corn maze. The farmer takes whatever mechanism they use to make it, and they go through the, the corn, and they create a maze. And then they charge you a little bit of money to walk through there and see if you can get lost. Uh, imagine, imagine that you were in the largest corn maze in the world. Somehow you're trapped in the very middle of it, and your job is trying to figure out your way out. It would probably get very, very confusing. You might turn left and right and right and left and try to figure it out, but you'd get more hopelessly lost. You'd think that maybe you'd been this way before, but not sure. One comedian said the sure way to, to get, if you're really, really lost, all you do is you take your clothes off. Security will come and they'll be <laughs> so It's just, that's, that's, that's a last ditch thing, of course. But, uh, but suppose you're in this, this largest of corn mazes in the world. You're disoriented, you're lost. You've been around every corner that you can think of. You've tried every trick that you know. You can't figure it out. And come across a kid. And the kid, uh, he's just undisturbed, man. He's got something in his hands, and you get up and talk to him. He goes, uh, you know, you, you want to find out if he's another customer here in the corn maze? He said, no, no, this is this is my dad's farm. Uh, this is this is his. I, I, I made the corn maze. He goes, well, do you know how to get out? Yeah, I know how to get out. He said, but even better, I can show you how to get out. Because in his hand, he's got a drone, and the drone's got a video, and the drone's up above the corn maze and can look down in it and can zero in on where you and this young man are at. And you can see, because you've got that 30,000 foot sort of perspective about how to get out of that corn maze. You can make your way out of it. This is where Nebuchadnezzar finds himself in this passage in, in need of wisdom. He doesn't understand what's going on. There was a disturbing dream. Let's read about it in Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, I don't know how you say it, <laughs> dream dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. And the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans for to show to show the king his dreams so that so they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. And then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servant the dream, and we will show the interpretation. And the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If I will not make known unto thou, if you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. I'm kind of a rough boss to work for. I, I, I'm kind of glad my boss got a little bit more patience than that. That's not a union job. Yeah, it's not a union job. <laughs> Verse six, and if ye show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. And they answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. And the king answered and said, I know of a certainty that ye would gain the time, because ye see the thing is gone from me. He said, But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying, corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. Then the Chaldeans answered before the king and said, this is, There is not a man on, upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asketh such things as any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king, except the gods who dwelleth not in flesh. Then drop down to verse 17. It says, well, hang on, I got lost here. There, and, and 17, then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, and that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And, and he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them 
uh, that no not uh, that no understanding and he revealeth the deep and secret things he knoweth the, what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him I thank thee and praise thee, O, o thou God, for my fathers who hath given me wisdom and might and, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Verse 24, therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon, and he went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. And Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known <coughs> unto the king the interpretation. And the king answered and said to Daniel, Whose name is Belshazzar? Art thou able to make known unto me the, the dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof? And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men and astrologers, magicians, and soothsayers show unto the king. But, this and that, this is huge, but God, and but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known unto King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. And the dream and the visions on the head of thy bed are these. For thee, O king, that thy thoughts came unto thy mind and thy bed that would pass, that would should come to pass hereafter. What he revealeth secrets maketh known unto thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. And then he talks about this great image, and, and I'll just, he talks about the image that's head is fine gold, um, and then the breast and arms are silver, the belly is and thighs of brass, and the legs and feet are, are iron mixed with clay. And, and this, these are succeeding kingdoms that Daniel is prophesying. We'll kind of get into that in, in a little bit. But what you find here is there is a need to seek wisdom in life. We, Don't you look around and, and, and you see the decisions that people are making and you wonder whatever happened to wisdom? Whatever happened, even just raw human <laughs> intelligence seems to have disappeared from the planet, yeah. much less godly wisdom. But I mean, even, even the basic yes. ability to be able to reason has somehow vanished off of the planet. And so... You have these people that are that are now struggling to figure out what bathroom to use, or how or how men's and women's sports are supposed to take place, or how you know they just lack any basic common sense, and and it's so disturbing and frustrating that we live in this time. And now it's even it's even worse because now we have all of these false news sources that are there. So even sometimes the information that we get is flawed, slanted information, you know, sort of spin information that somebody's put out and, and, and paid for to be go by in, in various places or whatever. And so now you have to try to figure out whether, whether what's on the news is even real or not real. You, you almost miss the days when when somebody would be on the news and they would tell you the facts that happened that day, and then they could end it and say, "Well, that's the way it was," you know. And, you know, you, you miss that because now, now it's all opinions and bloviating and spin, and so you try to make your way through this, this incredibly complex world, and, and, and almost I, as I was trying to think through this, I, you know, we we almost have to teach logic again in schools. We almost have to teach. Uh, the ability to think and reason from first principles. We, we have to go back to teach people how to think. They, they honest, honestly don't know how to think. And, and so we need that, but then we need, a, even beyond that, we need wisdom that flows down from God to show us those things that we lack, even within logic and wisdom and first principles. So. I think this is a timely passage for us. Here's what, how Charles Spurgeon phrased this. He said, Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know is not to be wise. Many men know a great deal, and they are the greater fools for it. But there is no fool so great as a fool as a knowing fool, but to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. 
So you could be like, there are some incredibly smart people who have really high IQs, but they don't always do real well in real life. I mean, they don't always, they don't always know how to navigate just in the regular world that you live in. You and I would know what to do in a lot of those situations, but sometimes some of the very smartest people in the world don't have that level of wisdom as to how to live their day-to-day -day life. And that's probably a good skill to have for us, is to have that kind of wisdom. I think that's a very practical thing and certainly something that God wants. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he has a need for wisdom. In a particular way, there are groups of people that need wisdom even more profoundly than just you and I in our daily lives. If you're a leader over a nation, you might want to have wisdom. You, you might need wisdom from above to show you how to navigate the decision decisions that you're in. In, in modern America, we, we try that with our leaders. I mean, there is every morning that a president is in office, the best that I know, there is a, a daily briefing. And that daily briefing begins in the morning where oh, things overnight and whatever is breaking in the world, the leaders of the various intelligence organizations, they come in and they sit down with the president and they talk with the president about what's going on and sort of basic decisions get sort of run through in this daily briefing. Then also when things get real nasty, there's a thing called a situation room in the White House. And that's a, a room that has all kinds of feeds from all around the world, satellite imagery, uh, telecommunications, it, it's, a, it's a safe place, a bunker-like facility, and again, more of those same people that will be in the daily briefing, they try to give the president information that he's going to need. But i got to tell you, I'm not convinced the daily briefing and the situation room are working real well. I'm, I'm kind of hoping that they come up with something, maybe a prayer room, where people could go and pray and talk to God and download some wisdom from heaven so that they could make decisions that had a, some sort of a moral component to it instead of just the, uh, just the data and whatever else they're doing right now because it does not seem to be working. Sir. Different briefers. Yes, he had different briefers too, yes, yes. So Nebuchadnezzar had had this troubling dream. Uh, it, it said in verse 1, in the second year, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, and it says his sleep break. You ever had your sleep break on you? It, you're like, we, you woke up, and you woke up, you know? And, but, and he couldn't remember his dream. Apparently, I'm like Nebuchadnezzar in that. I have dreams that I don't always remember. My wife will wake up from a dream, and she can tell you in detail everything that happened in the dream. The conversations, the plot line, and her dreams actually make sense. There's a flow to them. They're, they're, I mean, like, it could be a book or something, man. My, the only thing that I remember about a dream is, like, there was a mountain lion in my closet. And I, and I woke up yelling because there's a mountain lion in my closet. That's the level of detail I have. She's obviously got more horsepower under her hairline than I do. But, but now Nebuchadnezzar was a dummy like me, and he woke up and he couldn't remember the dream. He had, he had no idea what it was, but then he gets his astrologer, soothsayers, uh, you know, Chaldeans there, and he tells them, if you don't tell me the dream and what the dream means, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Man, oh, that's, that's a rough guy, dude. <laughs> This is kind of unrealistic. And even Daniel tells him that kind of what he's wanting is unrealistic later after Daniel reveals the dream supernaturally to the, to the king. But, you know, le leaders are not always good people. You understand that? And so yeah. he's not a good guy. He's made this unreasonable uh, request and is looking to kill him. Now, these groups, they had various ways that they would use to try to discern this knowledge that was out of the grass. Some of them would study records of past dreams, and so they would kind of create a, a catalog of, of interpretations of dreams, a dictionary of dream imagery, so to speak. And then others, they would analyze, this is weird, man, they would analyze animal entrails. Now, I, what the, the intestine of a, of a pig has to do with what Nebuchadnezzar's dream was, I have no idea, but that's what they would do in, in this day. Uh, others would use ecstatic experiences, so they would go into kind of a trance or, or something of that nature, and then they would, they would hope to have some insight or understanding based on that. Others, of course, study the star movements, which you still have today, and, and they, they think that somehow the stars move and align in a certain way that somehow that's going to impact what's going on in your life. I want you to understand something. 
The stars don't know your future, but the one who created the stars and holds them in his hand, he does know your future. So really, I don't know that you need to know if Venus is in retrograde or if there's going to be some kind of a great planetary alignment. What you do need to know is the God of the universe that you can go to in prayer and he can give you wisdom. Because if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. God, who created the stars, wants to help you. So the, these, uh, and then typically, typically what they would do is, is they would, there was sort of a, a mumbo jumbo that they would give, and then they would come up with either an incantation or a potion that would ward off whatever evil effects were going to come to you based on that dream. So they would, you know, they had a magic spell that they were going to say that would make everything better. They had a potion, a lotion, or whatever that you could put on, and, and everything would be hunky-dory okay. And you need to understand something. There's a lot of con men that are on the planet. There, there, there are people that are, they're called mentalists, and they, they will show you this, and, and, and it's, it's a trick that they do. But it's called mentalism, and what they do, there's a guy named, oh, what's his name, Darren, Darren something. He's from England, and, and he, can, he can make it look like he's reading your mind. Now, he's not reading your mind, but they, they, have, they have ways that they use words and certain sentences that they phrase together in a certain way that they push you to make a decision. They push you to think a certain thing, and then they tell you that certain thing that they pushed you to think with the words that they said, and they say, you know, so you're thinking of a gray elephant, and you go, yes. I was. How on earth did you know that? Because they study how people's thought process works, and they know the right words to say to get you to that place, and you're like, and if you don't understand how this cold reading works, then you think that they've got information they don't have. Or, or you have these people that will that, that will claim to talk to the dead. So what they'll do is they'll tell you that I, I can go to the other side and I can communicate with them and I'm going to come back and tell you what your passed on loved one says about your situation. And then, then they'll go, let's see, I'm, I'm getting an A, I'm getting an A, is there an A here? Yeah, is that Andy? Somebody says, yes, Andy! Andy is the one! Boy, I'm getting Andy. Let's say, Andy, Andy was... Let's see, did he, Andy, Mrs., he's looking at the, a lady and looking kind of how the lady's thinking. He goes, Andy loved you very much. You know, and then, yes, my husband loved you. Your husband, Andy, loved you very much. He loves you. He wants you to know that he loves you and wants you to get on with your life. It's okay to move forward. Andy approves of everything you're doing. <laughs> Or they get a, you know, and but he didn't really talk to Andy. You see what I mean? But he made you think he talked to Andy. Or that crystal ball, I think of crystal ball. Seeing your future. You, young lady, are going to marry a tall, dark, handsome, rich stranger. They never say you're going to marry a short, ugly, fat, dumpy dude. You know? It's like, what happened? What, what, what about us poor, fat, ugly, dumpy dudes, man? How are we going to get married? So, so we need the real deal daily briefing that comes from God's word and God's Holy Spirit as he speaks into our life. It is not human machinations. It's not mumbo jumbo. It's not, it's not manipulated words and thoughts, but it's the true wisdom that is downloaded from God by prayer and study of his word so that we can have the wisdom to make it out of the corn maze of this old world. You know, it, it seems, seems to me that Nebuchadnezzar is admitting or saying that these guys are smarter than he is. Yeah, he is really. Uh, because yeah. he can't even remember his own. He doesn't even remember his own. He's a dummy like me. Um, so, so God reveals wisdom. So Daniel goes, and, and with his friends, they go to God in prayer. It's fascinating that... They don't stay up all night trying to work out what they're going to do in this situation. They pray about it and they go to bed. You know, they, then they get, and then God reveals the dream to Daniel when he's asleep. And Daniel acknowledges that this was a mercy from God, that God showed him what was going on. He doesn't go to God like God owed him something. The fact is, you, as you read through this prayer and, and this conversation that Daniel has with his fellow wise men and that came with him from uh, Jerusalem, he is 
he's like, you know, God is great. God, God rules over the universe. The mysteries belong to God. Those things that we don't know or understand belong to him. He can give it to us if he wants to give it to us. Um, he, he sets up kings. He deposes kings. He's, he's God. He, he's the king of Nebuchadnezzar. And so Nebuchadnezzar is in his hand just like we're in his hands. And Daniel has this very proper balanced theology that you read in these verses. And it's really, really good. I, I mean, he wants us to understand that we can depend on God. I think one of the reasons God allows us to get into situations where we can't figure it out ourselves is so we'll go to him that he'll know how to figure it out. In, in, in the, there was a, one of the Jeopardy questions was, uh, the final question was some, was some puzzle that was in like 300 in a particular area. And, and I, I told him, it's the Gordian knot. I, I knew what it was, the Gordian knot, and it was a knot that was reputed to be impossible to untie, and the person that could loose the Gordian knot would be able to go into Persia and take Persia. And of course, they had that Alexander the Great came in, saw the knot, whacked it with a sword, went in and took Persia. You know, and but sometimes we get so caught up in our Gordian knot of life, and we don't know if I pull this, it'll tighten that. Have you ever had your kids get their shoes in such a knot you couldn't get it out? You thought you were going to have to burn the shoe to get rid, you know, get rid of it because you couldn't get the knot out of it. Sometimes our lives get in those Gordian knots. They get in those those situations that you just can't figure it out. And I think maybe the reason God allows sometimes those to develop is so we'll learn to trust in Him. So when you're younger, yeah, I've always loved watching sort of the kids go through these, these phases of development. When you're younger, you're sort of 10 foot tall and bulletproof. You're kind of a genius. You're 10 foot tall. You're bulletproof. There's nothing that life can throw at you you think that you can't handle. You know, so you come, you come into life with the bold assurance of youth and the vigor and vitality and the ability, and you come bursting into the room like Kool-Aid bursting through the wall, and you're going you're gonna to be large and in charge. And then you come in to hit real life, and real life, all of a sudden, you find out that that job that you're doing, you got laid off of. You know, and that relationship you're trying to build broke up. And that and that, that schooling that you're trying to work on, the funding didn't come through. And the and the doctor's report was somewhat less than stellar. It was one of those, you need to come in because we need to talk kind of a thing. And, and on and on you come up against these things until finally you recognize that life is a Gordian knot that I have no idea how to untie. Dear Jesus, please help me. And Jesus comes in and goes, whack! <laughs> but he doesn't do it until you ask him. He doesn't give you the wisdom until you come to him in humility and say, God, I have no idea what I'm doing. I, I, I don't know how to be a husband. I don't know how to be a father. I don't know how to be a pastor. I don't know how to do the, uh, fill these roles and goals like you want me to. God, would you please help me? I'm a dummy. You know, and God said, yes, Gene, I know you are. <laughs> Why? Well, I've been trying to tell you that for some time now. And, uh, and you're a bit of a slow learner in that regard. And uh, yes, so we come to God and we say, God, we need your mercy to show us wisdom as to what to do in this situation. And they do it. And God moves in a powerful way. It says in verse 19, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven. He went, woohoo! Hey, guys. God showed me the, the answer. We can go to we can go to the king, and and then it's set up. So Daniel shares the wisdom. Now, now I do like this about prayer because I think it's a maybe a way to to pray more effectively. Prayer is not just asking; it's a longing of the soul. It's a daily admission of one's weakness. It's better to pray. It's better in prayer to have a heart without words than words without heart. You understand that? That's what that passage means. The pastor was preaching on the effectual fervor prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When my passion is for God to move in a situation, and maybe it's so intense that I don't even know what to say about it, when I can get to that place, man, I think that moves the throne of God. But sometimes you can go, Dear Jesus, please bless America. Please, God, bless my family. Please, you know, we, we don't. And there's no passion behind it. There's no, there's no longing behind it. I, I wonder, does, is that just empty words? So, so Jesus warns against vain repetition in, in his teaching on prayer and the Sermon on the Mount. 
And he said that the heathen think that they should be heard for their much speaking. So sometimes we think if we just say the same thing again and again over a long span of time, that that equals prayer. But if it doesn't have your heart in it, it doesn't equal prayer. And that's why I take encouragement from Romans 8, where Paul talks about the Spirit making intercession for us when we're having that prayer time and we've got groanings that can't be uttered, the Holy Spirit works in that prayer in a powerful, profound way. And so uh, so sometimes when people come to me and they've got a, a thing that's going on in their life and they want me to pray for them, sometimes I think they think that I speak some sort of prayer language that God hears me. I, I don't have any kind of language that makes God hear me better. God hears you just fine. All you got to do is talk to God, you know. And so sometimes we think we think God only hears prayers in King James, you know. Look, I love King James, but but God, God hears prayers just the way you normally talk. When you come to the God of the universe and you talk about what's on your mind, what's in your heart, what's going on in your life, God hears that. God loves those kind of prayers. He doesn't want the the and the thou and the thus and the therefore. You know, that's not, that's not somehow advantageous. It's not the arithmetic of our prayer. It's not how many we've offered up. It's not the longevity of our prayer. It's not how many times that we've prayed it. It is just the effectual verbal prayer of a righteous man of the much. Um, lost my microphone. Um, so, so Daniel shares this. Verse. It's not just that God answers the prayer and shows Daniel. Daniel, I guess, could have kept it for himself or could have tried to make it so just he and his friends got saved from the wrath of the king. He doesn't do that. He just goes to the king, gives him the answer that God gave him, and he shares it there. And I think it's our job just to proclaim the truth of the word of God wherever we're at. Sometimes, sometimes we try to pre-select our audience. You know, we try to we try to winnow through who's who's ready to hear, who's not ready to hear. Our job is to sow the seed. You, you guys know the old the, the way that they would have sowed seed in the Old Testament times would have been kind of a broadcast. And they even still call it broadcasting if you're sowing seed. Say you want to create a, a lawn. I've had a couple of houses, the weeds were so bad I had to tear off the lawn and then replant grass. And you want to get that seed everywhere. You, you want to spread it broad. And the word of God is the truth that needs to get out to everybody. And so we got to be sure that we're not just pre-selecting and going, I'm going to tell my friends. No, don't just tell your friends. Tell everybody that has breath. Everybody that's got a heartbeat, they need to hear the message of the word of God. Okay, so this dream content involved this enormous statue of precious metals being crushed by rock. What does it mean? Probably the, the, the Daniel makes a definite interpretation that, that Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. And then there's the silver and bronze and iron that go down. And most scholars would say that probably what that means is the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Russian Empire. The four basic world governments over the span of biblical time. That's probably what that meant. But it doesn't just stop at, at the statue. But well and good that that's there. But then a mighty boulder, a rock, rolls out of a mountain and wrecks the statue. And that, that, that boulder is the kingdom of God. That's God's government, God's kingdom that rolls out and wrecks it. Um, one of the things you need to understand is everything here is temporary. I don't care how permanent it looks. Warren Wearsby, probably one of my favorite commentators, one of the things he says about this passage is he makes a contrast between this and chapter 7. Here, the world kingdoms are described as precious metals. And that's from man's perspective. We think, we think governments are, are all that in a bag of chips. You know, these, these governments, they're powerful, they're authoritative, they're all that in a bag of chips. In Daniel chapter 7, they're described as beasts. The same governments are described as beasts from God's perspective. They're predators from God's perspective. So you need to understand that. Sometimes we get, to, we get so comfortable where we're at, we don't understand God's got a bigger picture. And one day a rock's going to roll out and knock all this stuff down, and, and we're going to get into God's kingdom instead of just this mess that's going on around us. We need to close in prayer. Mighty Father God, I just pray that you help us not to get too dug into this old world system. God, it's completely broken. The, the, the only hope we have is revival that flows from your throne in heaven to us, a supernatural, capital R revival, that God's people's hearts are turned towards you and towards your will and work in our lives so that we could be a witness to this lost and dying world. Help us, God, to be ready for your forever kingdom that you're going to establish 
that where you rule and reign for an eternity, when every knee will bow, every tongue confess, and we will acknowledge your lordship for, throughout eternity. Keep us, God, in your will. Give us wisdom for our Gordian knocks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.